אז באמת התכנסנו פה בשביל אירוע מיוחד. א', להתחבר אליכם כמו תמיד, אנחנו נתמכים מכם ואין עליכם, והנה החבר שלי, דיוויד. אנחנו תכף עוברים לאנגלית בגלל שלפעמים יש כזה דו קרב. Uh, אני נכנס לאיזה מסעדה, וזה כמו המערב הפרוע ביני לבין המלצר, אני מזמין חומוס, והוא אומר לי, So you want hummus? Um, of course I want hummus. Um, אבל באמת, זה לא העברית שלו מול האנגלית שלו, זה הבנת האנגלית שלכם לעומת העברית שלי. So I'm sure everyone thanks me that we are now switching over. So David, good morning. Thank you so much. Good morning to all. Or... Almost good afternoon. Pleasure to be with you all. Yeah, we, we have really uh, many of your devoted fans here um, and on the Zoom, uh, and it's, it's just a great opportunity for us. So, so thank you, and I'll continue to say that. Um, so, you. So there's maybe two people in here who don't know the David Blatt story, so for that minority, um, maybe we can review a couple of uh, little details. Um, As I understand it, it started in uh, Framingham, Massachusetts. Is, is, that, is that correct? Uh, actually, born in Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, wow. But I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts before I went to college and then came to Israel as an Olay Hadash in uh, 1981. Right. So um, before that, um, you uh, um, studied and played some ball at, uh, at a, a small college in New Jersey called Princeton University. Um, and I, I think I want to say to everyone here, because I believe this is the case, there aren't basketball scholarships per se uh, in the Ivy League. You know, you earned it, and um, you got fantastic education, uh, you know, on the court and, and in the classroom. Um, and then you brought your talents here Um, and, th and then what, just so to be sure I understand, you uh, fell in love with an Israeli woman or had fell in love with the country or both, or how did, how did, what happened? Well, actually, I fell in love with uh, the uh, Israel, Israel the, uh, family way of life. I grew up, uh, my dad uh, left home when I was very young, and I was uh, raised by two uh, Jewish parents, uh, But uh, my parents not being together and my sisters going overseas to live with my dad left me at home with my mom and sort of uh, lacked the sense of the family that I found very quickly when I came to Israel. Uh, fortunately, uh, there, there, there's many names and many people that helped me to uh, acquire that sense of uh, togetherness and, and unity uh, and family. Uh, here in, in Israel, uh, and although I wouldn't describe myself uh, as a Zionist by education or by um, um, upbringing, I certainly became one very quickly when I came uh, to Israel, and uh, it's one of the prod proudest parts of uh, my life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I, I also think uh, Zionism is a bit of an infectious disease, and I say that as a physician in the positive sense. Um, so we, we want to talk about a bunch of topics. There were some questions that came in. Uh, there are some questions that are going to be coming in. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with, with this. Um, I'm wondering, you know, it, it's no secret that uh, about uh, uh, um, five years ago, I think, you started to notice uh, some symptoms, and before long, um, you were diagnosed with, with multiple sclerosis. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, from the beginning, we, we know about uh, your amazing successes as um, professionally, as a coach. Are there lessons you learned from coaching that have helped you in dealing with uh, this latest challenge? Well, the, the first thing, of course, that, that comes to mind uh, is eat more to do, you know, which is something that uh, we all are uh, very much a part of uh, today, given the uh, situation uh, in Israel specifically and, and also historically. You know, and, and, and being able to deal with difficulties in situations of, of any kind, some 
uh, minor and some major, such as those that we all uh, live with today, uh, certainly has helped me uh, to deal with my disease. Uh, I guess the, the biggest thing specific to that that uh, I, I, I carry and I live with is that it's a, it's a daily process. And it's uh, the challenge of, of making the best of uh, the situation at hand and never giving up. You know, I, I, I strongly, strongly uh, um, believe and ascribe to the theory of never give up uh, and, and dealing with uh, challenges uh, on a daily basis. Um, and hoping that by doing so, I, I can help myself and also provide some form of uh, inspiration to others. Yeah, when when I watch you coaching, um, I, and just to paraphrase some of what you said, one of the um, um, principles that jumps out at me, uh, well, I'll mention two of them, but first, I think because I think you just said it, is perseverance. I think your teams just know how to hang in there, and I can't tell you how many games I've watched where I might have even thought that, you know, Maccabi might have been overmatched against uh, Real when they're playing in Madrid, and you hang in there, and there you are at the fourth quarter, there's two minutes left, and it's anybody's game, and, and, you, can, and you, you can, and you do pull it out. Um, and it's, it's, it's just this remarkable um, uh, feature, um, the ability, you know, Hatmid. You know, it, it's very interesting that you say that and, and uh, I, I share this with, with you all almost sadly that <laughs> having to deal with uh, playing from behind or with having to come back or, or having to overcome uh, and pull you know pull yourself out of trouble it, it's a good thing on the other hand uh, not getting into a situation that causes you that need to, uh, to, to fight back or to find ways or to, uh, uh, to overcome, you know, that's part of it too. And, you know, something that I think all of us live with daily, uh, is the fact that, you know, this, this, this terrible, uh, situation that, uh, has befallen us, you know, perhaps could have been avoided before it even started. Uh, and, and I know that we all, each and every one of us, ask that question, and, and the people of our beautiful country ask that question. But those questions have to wait because the situation at hand calls for another kind of people to do it, another kind of perseverance, another kind of uh, meeting the challenges. And that, of course, is to to overcome uh, uh, enemies all over, uh, not just. Uh, on our borders, but uh, everywhere in the world, uh, some that we could have potentially avoided uh, dealing with and some that are just part of our existence. And the very reason that we're all sitting together today, caring about one another and supporting one another and uh, giving one another the opportunity uh, to help, which of course is, is perhaps the most unique and the most uh, wonderful thing of of us as uh, a Jewish people, uh, that when times are tough, we sure stand shoulder to shoulder and help one another. I just wish that sometimes we we, we wouldn't have to do that because we'd be to, together to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> and totally. we wouldn't get into tough situations that potentially we could avoid. Yeah, that in a way um, anticipates the, the follow-on question I wanted to pose, which is, um, and I think one of the things you're saying is this idea of um, cohesiveness that you're observing now, you know, maybe on a personal level, maybe on a national level, but any lessons that you see from your current situation that you can take back to the coaching arena? I mean, it probably works both ways, and I'm just wondering if you've, if you've given some thought about that. Sure. Well, I, 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 on a daily basis, am in contact with uh, any number of uh, MS sufferers. I also... You know, I'm a lecturer uh, for the world of sport and the world of business on leadership and problem solving uh, and planning and any number of subjects that 
have parallels between the world of uh, sport and the world of business or leadership. So, you know, I'm, I'm quite familiar and quite uh, active uh, in that field. Uh, certainly, uh, my priority today is to be able to reach out or be contacted by others that are going through similar situations to what I'm going through. Uh, and uh, hopefully provide some some form of uh, support or, or, as I mentioned to you, uh, inspiration. You know, and that, it comes from something, you know, it comes from being aware and it comes from educating yourself uh, or being and allowing yourself to uh, educate others um, and becoming uh, uh, a family, so to speak, uh, um, of, of people with similar, a similar set of circumstances or circumstances that this, this, the, the world of sport have uh, given me or shown me that allow me to share my knowledge and share my uh, uh, ideas with others. I saw an interview with you once um, where um, you were asked about... Uh, sort of how you're viewed or, you know, how you see your role and you use a word which I thought was, was very interesting. I think, and, and you said in a very humble way, um, I think you said that um, you realize you are an ambassador. Um, and I, I was very struck by that. I, I just, uh, by the way, I was warned uh, by someone here before I started, someone who I live with, that um, I can't get too much into basketball today, even though you know from our WhatsApps that 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 is my passion, forget this whole medicine stuff, um, unless I can find ways to make it generalizable. So I'll do my best. Um, but I was, there's a, there was a famous interview with one of the uh, NBA Hall of Famers named Charles Barkley, and it was um, released that he had a gambling problem, and Barkley was approached in the locker room and said, what are you, what are you gonna do? You know, you're, you're a role model for all these kids. How can you be out there with a, drug pro with a, a gambling problem? And he said, well, Charles Barkley didn't ask to be a role model for anybody, so that's your problem. And, and I see what you do is 180 degrees away from that. You said, no, I'm stepping up. People are looking at me. I have this set of responsibilities, and I'm going to carry myself a certain way. That, that's how I interpret it. I just wonder if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Well, first of all, uh, it's interesting because I know Charles, and Charles has also... <laughs> gone away from what his original uh, uh, theory or original view of himself. Uh, he's come a long way and he's become uh, a role model for, for others. I was born into that, I, I, I think, um, and taught from a very early age that it's, it's important to give to others and it's important to, uh, if you can, uh, help others, uh, if, if not more than by being a, a good example of, of uh, what a human being should be, you know, as a, as a Jewish person and a Jewish man, you know, our uh, way of life certainly teaches us the importance of uh, following, whether it be culturally or educationally, uh, certain um, forms of of uh, dedication and of uh, uh, belief. And for me, being able to live my life through sport and to share my ideas together with my sense of uh, Judaism and, and later, of course, in my life of Israel, you know, it was a dream come true. And, and, and truthfully, to give a, a simple answer to you, I would have much rather been uh, an ambassador uh, formally to uh, to the United States from Israel or from Israel to the United States had I begun my uh, process uh, or career in that field. You know, I just ended up becoming a basketball coach and trying to uh, represent and to uh, be an example of uh, the better th things from uh, our faith and, and our country and culture uh, and do it in a way that uh, would allow me and, and us to cross borders and, and cultures and languages and, 
and and uh, share with others a, uh, a good example of, of what it is that we are and who it is that we are. And, you know, from that res- respect, I was uh, mevorach, and I was blessed that I could live my dream, but through sport. By the way, I want to say that uh, unlike uh, me on this side, every time that you say something humorous, uh, your line is landing. So just so you know, there's laughter when, when you want there to be laughter. And you'll have to teach, teach me about that, Coach, as well a little bit later. Um, By the way, if you, you said you, you, you wanted to be a coach. If you want to change jobs, I'd be more than happy. You can do that anytime. <laughs> you know? Everyone around me would appreciate think, that, so we should doing, also negotiate I think what it. you're doing is... I think what you're doing is more important than what I'm doing. So God love you. I think that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, I remember when um, um, you were hired by, by the Cavaliers, uh, Mr. Schneider, the, the owner, um, when he was asked, you know, by ignorant Americans, you know, who is this guy? He said, well, this, this guy's a winner. This guy's been in the EuroLeague. This guy's been in the Adriatic League. This guy's been uh, at the Olympics. And he just always does one thing. He just always wins. Um, and, and then you did it at Cleveland as well, and we'll maybe talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and um, so, so you say you were born into it, and there's just this success that, that, that drips around uh, you and your aura. Um, and then, as we said, you know, a bad break happens, um, and uh, this is in two of the cards here, and it was on my list of questions too. Do you, do you ever ask the question, why me, on that one? Just like there was, you might ask, why me? I'm so successful, and I know you did a lot to actualize that success, but you ask, why me, in terms of the fate of this diagnosis on any level? Um, you know, I, I'll give you an example of how, how I've always dealt with uh, uh, winning and losing, and, and I, if I could say specifically uh, a game, any, any game. And at the end of that game, I, I've always uh, made it a point to uh, ask my staff or ask my players. Uh, regardless, I've always asked the same question. It's, it's, anyone who's worked with me will tell you. The first thing I always say after a game is, did we deserve to, to win? In other words, had we done uh, our work in a committed fashion uh, and, and with the uh, the knowledge and the, the education that we have and with, with all our heart. So, you know, the idea of being, doing your best to be your best was always uh, so critical. And, and when things weren't great, I always asked again, the same three questions. N- number one, what's the problem? Number two, why did it happen specific to your question at this moment? And number three, how do we fix it? So, specific to my disease, I always left the second question out because that's for you. That's for doctors. I, I don't know why it happened. They don't know why. Uh, they don't know the cause of my particular uh, condition, other, other diseases. They do. In my case, they don't. Uh, but uh, I do understand and have made myself understand and constantly educate myself on what the problem is. I skipped the why did it happen? Because uh, it's a waste of time for me in this in this particular case. Uh, I can't stop smoking or or, or something like that, uh, and 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 uh, get a result. I don't smoke. Number one and, and number two, it wouldn't help me at this point. Uh, but number three, how do we fix it? I think that's what I I uh, spend most of my time. Uh, on now, and, and in my case, since it's not a disease that has a cure, nor uh, do you get better from it, what you can do is manage it. You know, you can strengthen the rest of your body, and you can strengthen your mind, and you can work with and help other people uh, so that uh, emotionally and, and, and uh, uh, mentally you can, you can stay strong, you know, so that, that, that's really how I, I go about it. You know, what's the problem? Why did it happen? How do we fix it? So I'm, I'm concentrating on one and three right now. I mean, I think that's an amazing answer. Um, I think it's very consistent with what we've been talking about before you came on the screen about uh, a hopeful approach uh, to life. You know, there's that uh, 
idiom in Hebrew where they say sometimes it's just pointless to ask lama and instead ask le ma, and um, that's the more productive view of it. And I, I um, it, not at all to ridicule the people who, who ask those questions, but I, I really think that's a very, very healthy approach to it. Um, I think that's, that's really amazing. Um, one of the other things that people start to think about, at least the people I talk to with the illnesses uh, I'm dealing with, is, is the question of um, regret. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, you've given you know, thought to that. I, I, I've seen the question in, in your career, and I don't know the answer. I don't know if you want to deal with it now or just address this in general, but like when you entered the NBA, I, as I recall, you had this choice to be the associate coach at Golden State, which was f effectively uh, the best team in the league right there, or to stay on the level of a head coach. Um, I'm wondering, as a basketball fan, if that, if that would, if there's any regret associated with that, or if you think about regret in your life, or is that not part of the equation? Well, that, I have a theory on that, and I certainly don't want to uh, uh, try to ed educate anyone to my way of thinking. I, I think we all have regrets in life. If you don't, you probably never made a mistake, and I don't know that that's realistic. You know, there, there's things that, that certainly <laughs> I uh, would have done differently had I had the benefit of the luxury of knowing beforehand what the result uh, would be, uh, but that's okay. You know that that that's life, and and you have to uh, you have to be uh, honest with yourself and and open minded uh, to recognizing that everything doesn't everything doesn't always go as planned. You know, or maybe uh, my dad, God rest his soul. You know, he used to say when you come into when you come to a fork in the road, just take one, just take one <laughs> spiel, you know, one lane, and go with it. Uh, so, you know, specific to that question, uh, could I have gone to the Golden State Warriors and lived in California, which I've where where I've never ever lived, instead of going to Cleveland, Ohio, great great place, weather isn't as nice, you know. I don't know, maybe I could have, but the the, the point is that. Uh, uh, I did it, and I did it to the best of my ability. And that particular uh, choice, it, it, perhaps it didn't work out the very best for me in some ways. In other, part, in other ways, you know, it was part of my life, and it was an amazing experience. And, you know, we did pretty well, but, you know, could it have been different? Could things have gone differently? I, I think yes, but that's okay, you know. You, you, we all, you know, and I, I don't want to talk only about myself, but, you know, we all go through things in life where we make decisions that we try to be educated about and we try to be uh, smart about. And either they don't necessarily work out or we weren't as smart as we think we are. So, you know, you you either got to about face and do something differently or you got to figure out how to fix it. Uh, and that's okay too. That, that, that's part of life. I love that answer. Um, I want to tell two stories, uh, two David Blatt stories that I might mangle them and you'll correct me uh, if I do, but two things that I recall hearing you say, I didn't see this in print, but just in interviews I've watched with you in the last uh, decade or so. To me, they're very meaningful stories. I, I'd like to hear your expansion on them which is maybe the way I look at it, maybe I'll connect it in a different way. But one story is when you were at um, Princeton, you worked with a legendary coach whose pronunciation I always botch. I think it's Pete Care Ill. I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce his name, but um, he's on the level of John Wood. Right. And um, when you were starting out, I think with the Cavs, uh, they said, so what are some unique features? What are like your chidushim that you're going to bring? And you quoted your coach. And um, you said, I love this, you said, the ball has an energy. I remember hearing you say that. Um, that's one story. And then there was another story, and I don't remember who the interviewers were and exactly when it was, but um, you, you told this uh, tale of, of, uh, of a game, which I think you weren't even expected to win, and you won. And at the end of the game, um, one of the referees came up to you and said two things. First of all, he congratulated you on the win. And then um, he said to you, 
it was really nice working with you. And as I recall the story, what you said was that that was a news flash. Like, yeah, he, I was. He's part of this. He, in other words, like most of us fans, we're just looking at the game and we don't see the ref. He's invisible to us. And it made you realize there are all these different components to our lives. I thought that was very, very deep. Maybe I'm misinterpreting the story, but I wonder if those two stories are evocative for you like they are for me. Well, first of all, thank you for reminding me of those uh, two stories, particularly the second. I'm going to uh, advocate on that a little bit. Uh, the first, the first uh, quote from, from Coach Grill came uh, uh, as part of his philosophy of, of sport and of basketball, which was to share, to share the basketball because it gives you energy and it gives you uh, strength. Uh, and it makes me think of course, it, it makes me think uh, of course of uh, oh, we're not hearing you now hold on maybe a mute We're all Zoom experts. There it is. There Thank we go. You. Thanks. Okay. So, you know, Coach Carrill's uh, sentence really came from the idea of playing together and gaining straight strength from one another by by sharing. You know, and and today, you know, you, you look at the people from from our country who have, you know, gone to the streets literally to give and to help and to support in just an amazing uh, example of, of, uh, of togetherness and of unity uh, um, to support our soldiers and to support one another, you know, people giving their homes to, to others that are being moved due to uh, the dangerous environments that they live in or, or, you know, whether it be financial support or whether it be uh, examples of you know of, of physical uh, things that you know just help other people I mean, it, 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 that's from the same philosophy that you mentioned and it's, it's very uh, nice for you to make me think of, even think of it that way because that's another parallel that you see between sport you know the idea of course to make another one better and and by doing so you make yourself better you know uh so that that's such a critical thing the second story uh which uh is very very meaningful to me that the gentleman the referee that you you mentioned his name is bill kennedy he's one of the premier referees in the united states he does uh he's he's in all the finals and and is a long time successful referee and bill after a game in the olympics uh, came up to me and this is before i was in the nba and he, he did indeed say coach it was a pleasure working with you you know and generally you have an adversarial type relationship with the with the officials which is too bad because they're, they're great guys you know for the most part except when they don't give you the call that you want but it doesn't change the fact that they're people and that they uh uh, they might be your best friend if you ever get to know him off the court. What, what I think is interesting uh, about Bill, you know, Bill was the first official to come out publicly as a, uh, as a gay man. And in this world of uh, uh, sport, you know, that's maybe the last thing that people expected or, or, or accepted. And he's, he's such a courageous, principled uh, good human being, you know, and he, and he wasn't afraid to, to step forward and to be himself and to, uh, you know, to offer some, by example, perhaps some support to another uh, group of people. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, he, he's just such a genuine human being and uh, we're not close uh, because we, you know, we don't live in the same uh, circles, 
But I can tell you this, if we if we were, he'd probably be one of my best friends. <laughs> He's just that good a guy, you know, he really is. And uh, taught me a valuable lesson about uh, uh, unity unity in sport. That's, you know, it's it's we're all part and parcel of one another, even if we're supposedly on different sides, you know, officials and and coaches or, or players and and managers or whatnot, you know, having a basic respect and, and uh, 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 a, a true appreciation of one another as human beings uh, is really the most important thing. Well, that, those are great insights. Um, I was combining the stories maybe a little bit more simplistically because uh, I saw within them one of the... Well, I'm never simple. You didn't bring <laughs> me here to be simple, did you? No, of course not. <laughs> And uh, you're you're living up to all of our expectations beyond. We really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> but one one of the things that that I see is um, that you know in Israel we talk about the shkufim. They're just the people that are almost invisible, um, but they're there. They're in our lives. And and I even with the first story, I thought you were taking it to another dimension. Thing. Even an inanimate object like the ball is having this impact on my life. And um, there was this really interesting, we talk about this in our organization, set of um, um, studies that came out uh, during COVID from the University of Sussex in the UK. And one of the investigators there um, talked about what she called minimal social interactions, that among the people that didn't crumble in COVID and didn't really falter with loneliness were the ones who not only maintained you know, business relationships on Zoom, but could do some of their routine and could see the barista at the coffee shop, even if I don't know his name, or the you know the 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 the, the, the person opening the door, just knowing those people are there in our lives. Um, and you talk about family before, even beyond the you know the the cousin I know or I fight with, but even beyond those people in my life, it's just a certain sense of reassurance that these individuals who maybe I wasn't cognizant of are um, just they're, they're critical ingredients to who I am. And uh, I, I felt that in, in, in some of the stories uh, that we were telling. I, you also talked about this idea of, of sharing. Yep. And um, I would imagine that you know, another side of that coin is to, you know, to reach a level of sharing and you know, probably the, the cohesion that you need uh, on a team. I, I don't think that just happens. I, I would imagine, and I want to hear what you have to say, that there's a lot of... Um, you know, conflicts that need to be resolved or anticipated um, in coaching. Um, and I'm wondering if that's one of these principles that you see, you know, in your life, uh, with your family, w whatever it might be, this idea of being able to anticipate conflicts or when they arise to help resolve them. You know, that, that, that's a really good uh, point and, and subject one that I'd love to uh, expound on, given given perhaps more time. But I, you know, I I can tell you that one of the primary things that I try to teach um, my teams or in in my sports life, of course, was that um, you know the idea of inter interdependence and and um, each person person understanding that, that he has a role to play and that no one role is more important than the, than the next. Uh, but it may not be the same. And, and I like to quote uh, a wonderful uh, line from the book or the poem and the movie, The Jungle Book, you know, and, and that is the power of the pack is the wolf and the power of the wolf is the pack, you know, that we each and, and, and all have something to contribute. And my job as a coach was to show appreciation for everyone's contribution so that, that they would be uh, motivated uh, to give their best and to do their part to help the uh, cloud, you know, to help the, the whole group. Uh, and that's how you could build a successful and a sustainable uh, team. When, when all the parts were working together and, and the together was serving each of the parts and each of the individuals uh, in some way. 
so that they recognized their value and, and they took pride in it and could go forward with it either to a, an even better place or, or uh, certainly uh, to a better feeling. Uh, unquestionably, one of the major goals of mine as a coach and, and maybe one of the most important things that uh, I could and tried to give as give my teams and my players. Yeah, that really showed. Um, in the opening remarks before you came on the screen, uh, the president of our organization, Devora, um, made some references to uh, some of the heroic statements that we've been witness to in the last uh, two months. And one of them was uh, uh, Sarit Zusman after she lost uh, her son, uh, Ben, 23 years old, who had fallen in Gaza. And um, she really maintained her dignity. And that yet in an interview after the eulogy, uh, when the journalists were approached, they almost were trying to suck her in, it seemed, to um, you know, her opinions about government or specific politicians, and she wouldn't take the bait. And she said, look, I see where you're going. That's not what I want to talk about. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But as I understood what she said, she said, you know, one of my most interesting experiences was for a while I worked as a gun in it. And when I was in the gun, I became an alufa at identifying and dealing with conflicts. And if we could all just understand that there's a way, as you're saying, to cohere uh, and to put aside some of the differences and to celebrate some of the you know, overlap in our identities, it would make all the difference. And I, th I think it's just a really, really powerful message, especially at this time. Um, Unquestionably. Yeah. Those, those, people, those people are heroes themselves and, and examples for all of us. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm noticing without being without being asked to do it, without being asked to do it. You know, I'm noticing every time the earpiece, the earbud comes out, we see your athleticism because you've managed to snare each one. How about that catch? It's huh? really it's that's amazing. A of, that's a heck of a catch. <laughs> but <laughs> now I now I'm showing off. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, enough of that. Um, but I kind of want to use that as a springboard to another question, which is that. Uh, you see how I did that? Which, which is, um, you know, you've, you've really done so many things. And really, most of us in the room have so many different, you know, persona. You're, you're, you know, you're a coach and um, you're a basketball executive and, uh, you know, you're a dad of a star basketball player and you're a husband. And you have all these different um, roles that you play in your life. And in the last few years, you've been shoehorned also into the role of somebody dealing with a disease. And I'm wondering if that can be a source of strength at all, not to put any words in your mouth, but do you kind of shuttle among those different roles? Is, is that something you see yourself doing? Is it worth doing? I'm just curious about your thoughts on that one. Well, absolutely. And if, if, if I may, I'll, I'll quote the famous uh, American uh, basketball coach, John Wooden, who said, uh, Things work out best for people who make the best of how things work out. You know, given my situation and need to retire from active coaching, uh, just became a springboard for me to do other things and to try to do them to the best of my ability to continue to influence, impact, and help uh, and grow. And uh, you know, I, I think that's a that's a good a good lesson for all of us. You know, you don't, you don't have to stop being relevant. Uh, and, and relevancy in this case is, is more a matter of, of doing and giving and, and uh, uh, accomplishing by helping others. So, you know, I just, I just, I just try, try, try every day and, and decided that that's what I was going to do with this. Um, we're all faced with uh, challenges, and, and it's, it's what you do with it. I think it's the most important thing. Wow. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to start to ask a few uh, wind-down questions because we're sort of at the 10-minute warning. Um, so, um, you know, in the build-up to this event, you know, people heard, you know, Coach Blatt was coming, so there was a lot of interest, as you can imagine. And I got sent questions by email and by WhatsApp, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the most frequently asked question. I don't expect you to answer it. I want to, if, if you want, you can, but nobody expects you to answer it. But um, I also want to tell the crowd that um, when David and I were 
um, planning this, he said, you know, feel free to ask questions, don't worry. But I'm just going to ask it because it was a common question. And I want to use it as a springboard to mention a phenomenon that I, I think exists, and, and that's really what I'm interested in hearing. So when you, well, first of all, I didn't even ask you before about your decision to be very public about this. You know, you didn't, you didn't hide, you wanted, you know, I think you were at Olympiakos at the time, and I think you mentioned that, you know, it was a great, you know, European powerhouse. The management um, was very supportive of you, but you decided yourself that um, you had to make a change. Um, but again, you didn't have to be so vocal, and yet, yet you were. And then I think you mentioned that there was an outpouring of support um, that uh, uh, followed. Um, and then, you know, as, the, as it would be with celebs, um, people always start getting curious. So one of the questions I got, but I'm just going to say it quickly and then I'm going to go to the next one is, you know, did LeBron James reach out and say Rafael Schleimer to David Blatt? So I don't want you to answer it, but um, um, what I, what I, I didn't ask it. Um, what I want to do is I want to explore with you the difficulties that we as a society have with illness. In other words, here you are, you're a successful coach, you're an athlete, you're a scholar athlete, um, and then all of a sudden there's a, there's a wrinkle, there's, there's a change anyway. Um, and maybe some of us just have Maybe even out of respect for you, maybe some of us have um, an inhibition about almost bringing that up, about reaching out to you on that level. Do, is there this tension that existed once all of a sudden you announced that you suffered from MS um, th that all of a sudden fl flowered and in, 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 in took on a life of its own, you know, its own energy, if you will? Uh, no. Actually, it was... Uh a source of strength for me, you know, it, it can be, uh, it can be invigorating to, to recognize, you know, difficulties that you're having and then share them with others, uh, and gain strength from them. And then recognizing that you have the opportunity to, uh, give something to, to help, you know, which, which of course is again, it's it's very much a part of our culture, as as Jewish people uh, worldwide. You know, we, we all deal with uh, uh, forms of uh, uh, anti-Semitism. We we deal with the sometimes uh, threats, or even beyond that, you know, which we've all experienced uh, recently. Um, so not hiding from what it is that, uh, challenges us and not shying from who we are and what responsibility we have, I think is, is, uh, it, it empowers us to, to do more, to give more, to be more. And again, I, I, I've seen that in, in our people, you know, worldwide, the, the, the actions and the activity and the support and the, uh, the giving of, of, of the Jewish people worldwide, not, not only in, within the borders of Israel, but from the diaspora, you know, it's, it's just been, it's been so uh, inspiring. Uh, so specific to that kind of question, I, I would just tell you that uh, knowing who you are and being proud of that fact and, and sharing it openly and honestly um, gives you strength and it, and it gives you also a lot of support from, from others and where it doesn't, you know, you just you get stronger to meet that challenge. Um, you know, I lived in seven different countries and always in my mind, uh, first and foremost, was to uh, let it be known who I am, where I'm from, uh, and what I'm about in a positive way, and in an in a, in a, uh, exemplary way, and, and not fear that because of that, I was going to have more problems. You know, I was going to use that as a, as a source of uh, strength. Uh, and that, you know, you could, that could be specific to my physical situation. That could be specific to my cultural situation. Uh, you know, we are who we are for a reason. 
and it's on all of us to carry that with, with uh, dignity and with uh, a sense of pride and with uh, the idea that by helping uh, one another, we all get stronger.